Do it here with the Wiener filter. Uh, let us uh, think again about the, the Wiener filter. So, let us. Okay, so the Wiener filter, the model is the following. So, we have a signal. It goes to a transfer function, and then we have some noise. Some noise, and this is our observation. So our observation is eight from all the date plus noise. And, and the filter, so if we want to recover, if we want to recover uh, X, X. So the original. So the original is the following. So it is eight on X and then eight squared plus one over the signal times the observation. Okay, so this is our binary then. So this is the binary then. And it is in Fourier space. So we so this is in free space. And let's say that we have an infinite signal to noise ratio. So we have a lot of signal. We oh, the opposite. We have no noise. So they, those are equivalent sort of uh, uh, situations. So if we have no noise, the signal to noise ratio goes to infinity. So this one goes to infinity. And the whole thing goes to zero. Do you agree with that? That's when there's no noise. Sorry? You said that that was when there's no noise. Yeah. So if there is no noise, signal to noise ratio, signal to noise ratio is the ratio between the power of the signal divided by the power of noise. So if we have no noise, the signal to noise ratio goes to infinity. Sorry? If there's any kind of noise. Yeah. Yeah, for instance, when. Yeah, this is more like a theoretical exercise. Okay, so uh, what would happen if we have a very, very, very high signal to noise ratio? So, yeah, absolutely no noise. It doesn't exist in reality, but, but uh, let's think what happens if we have a, a very, very high signal to noise ratio. Okay, so then this term disappears. So that means that we have no noise. So we have no noise. So this term disappears. And then what we have is Eight conjugate and then y. But you know that so the module squared of h, the module squared of h, you know it is a times h conjugate conjugate. So these two terms simplify. And then this is 1 over 8 y. Does it make sense or not? This is all the time for the expansion. Does it make sense? It does. If we have no noise, how would you? So you can transform this equation in Fourier space. So you transform this equation in Fourier space as y is equal to x times h. And if you want to recover x, then you simply have to divide what you observe by the Fourier transform of the the kernel that you have from home. 
Okay, so you may think of the Wiener filter. So this Wiener filter, it is for very high signal to noise ratios. It is similar to this. And for low signal to noise ratios, it is something that is somehow similar to that, but it prevents dividing by zero. So if you have very low signal to noise ratio, let's let's do the opposite exercise. Okay, so let's let's uh, go here again. To X, this is H, and then by Now let's go to the opposite uh, situation. So you have a very, very low signal to noise ratio. So if this is so low, this then goes to zero. And if this goes to zero, the whole thing goes to infinity. And I'm missing the signal we are quickly. Okay, so the whole one over signal to noise ratio goes to infinity and then we are dividing something divided by infinity so that is zero so this whole uh, so this whole thing goes to zero so the signal the, the finger filter is somewhere in between depending on what is the signal to noise ratio for each frequency so, if you have a very high signal to noise ratio, you behave in this way so that uh, you are almost inverting just the, the, the kernel that you have used to, to produce your image. And if you have a very, very low signal to noise ratio, you are not doing anything. So, you are keeping it to zero. And that makes sense. If, if I have a very low signal to noise ratio, I don't have any signal to recover there. But or the signal is embedded in, uh, under the noise. So, so it is better to, to not to do anything because otherwise it would, you would boost the noise. And just a comment. So this equation here, this one here. This is in frequency. Okay, so that is a, it depends. I have not written it, but it depends on, on the frequency. So it is the signal to noise ratio. Okay, so uh, that is no. It is four in So the important thing here is that it depends on the frequency. So you don't have the same signal to noise ratio at all frequencies. And that is what we were seeing the other day. The other day here, we were uh, discussing that at some frequencies you have more signal than noise here. You have more signal than noise than here. You have more noise than signal. So the ratio between the signal and noise is not constant. It depends on, on every frequency. And the Wiener filter somehow adapts to what is the local signal to noise ratio. Okay, so if you don't know for every frequency what it is, then at least you might know uh, depending on the radius of the frequency. And, and then you may Instead of making it 2D, this is a this is 2D, right? But instead of making it 2D, you may uh, approximate it by a, a 1D signal to noise ratio, and this is what is normally done. So instead of on the frequency vector, on the module of that vector. So you go from there to there. What you do is the module. Of this vector. And then what it has is so you think that the signal to noise ratio decays with something like 
And that makes sense because if you think of these, this we said this is more or less like one over the module of omega squared, and this is more or less for white noise this constant. So this has to behave as one over down uh, one over omega squared. So you know specifically for every every frequency as we have here in the simulated example. So in the simulated example, you know exactly for each frequency. I don't know if you tell that. So here in this simulated example, you know for every frequency, you know exactly what the signal to noise ratio is. But if you don't know, because here you are simulating, but in reality you are not simulating, you don't know what is the signal to noise ratio at every frequency. But you may characterize your system in such a way that at least you know that here you have larger signal to noise ratio at low frequencies you have larger signal to noise ratio and at high frequency you have a smaller one and you may try to put numbers on the, on, on, on that and then you come out with this kind of curves and those are the ones that normally are, are used okay so let's see how it goes with an example Okay, so yeah. So here again, uh, we have a simulated example so that we can be compared at the end to the to the uh, to the original signal. So we have this ideal signal. This is the noise, and then this is our observation, uh, and then this is the uh, the original image, uh, the power spectrum of the original image, the power spectrum of the noisy image. You may remember that what we are observing here is the power spectrum of the original plus the power spectrum of the noise. And that is why you don't see anymore these lines at high frequency because they are embedded, or they are buried under the noise. Um, yeah, so in this particular example, because we are simulating, we know exactly what is the, the signal to noise ratio at all frequencies. So we can implement this filter with a signal to noise ratio. This filter here is a signal to noise ratio that depends on every 2D frequency. And what is the shape of that filter? So this is how the filter looks like. So at low frequency, it looks as a, as the inverse of the kernel. So what is the kernel here? So what have we done with our image? So we have taken the idea plus noise. So what is the kernel? The delta function. And the Fourier transform of the delta function is a constant. So it is the inverse of the of the kernel, but the kernel is a constant. It is just one, so we are not doing anything. Okay. Uh, so this is the inverse of the kernel, and, and then at high frequencies, it is going to be multiplied by zero. And for those frequencies where we have more energy, the input signal, so these lines coincide with the lines that we had in the original system. Because at, at those lines, we had a higher signal to noise ratio. So at those lines, we will emphasize these coefficients. We will emphasize these coefficients rather than these ones. Because here in this line, along this line, we have higher energy. Uh, uh, so this is after the filtering, so we have recovered most of these uh, high energy coefficients at high frequency, and we may compare to the original. And this is the noisy image, 
and, and this is what we have recovered. So we have not fully get rid of, got rid of the, of the noise. You see some oscillations still in the background, for instance. So these oscillations are the background. The background is mostly high frequency or low frequency. This is low. So at low frequency, if we look at the filter, at low frequency, the filter was almost one everywhere. So that is why the noise at, at high frequency, at low frequency, has a state. But then uh, we, we see that the, the edges of these uh, geometric figures, they are very well preserved. And uh, this is the original, and uh, this is the Gaussian blur, just for comparison. And you see that the edges, they are very, very uh, much smoother in the, in the Gaussian blur than in the Wiener filter. So the Wiener filter is able to recover high frequency edges. But it is exploiting the knowledge that at high frequencies, in this particular coefficient, we have higher signal to noise ratio. So if you have that knowledge, then you can exploit it very efficiently. But otherwise, uh, if all you have is, is just that at high frequencies, you have a higher uh, or a, a smaller signal to noise ratio, so you have this kind of, of radial curves. So instead of just being different for every frequency, you keep the same value for all the high frequencies. So you take this value here, and you apply it to all the frequencies having the same uh, radius. So you would take that value, um, that value, and apply it all along the circle. All the points, all the frequency components having the same radius would take the same value. Okay, so the more you know about your signal to noise ratio, the better you can exploit it. Uh, yeah, so this is now with the with the kernel. So now the kernel is a Gaussian filter with uh, mu zero and sigma equal two. This is in real space. So we have a, a sigma of two pixels in real space. And then this is the original. This is the noisy image where we are uh, convolving with, with this kernel. So in Fourier space, we are multiplying by the Fourier transform of the, of the Gaussian. And then the Wiener filter looks like this. And it makes sense because Okay, so, so we have the Fourier transform. This is the Fourier transform of this is the Fourier transform of the input signal, but we are multiplying by this filter, so by a Gaussian filter. Gaussian like this, so this is the module of, of the filter, and then the high frequency components, the high frequency components, they have to be multiplied almost by zero. Or let's exaggerate it even more, so let's make a new drawing. So more exaggerated would be something like this. So the signal is like this. And the filter is like this. So all these components, all these components have been filtered out by the by the Gaussian. So we cannot recover them. The signal to noise ratio there is almost zero. So that is why the Wiener filter prevents these uh, high frequency components being boosted because we don't have signal there. It, it was deleted by the filter. So you may compare 
this beginner filter, uh, this one, where you don't have a, a, a Gaussian filter in between, you, you don't have a point of spread, a spread function, and you may compare it to this one, where we know this one, where we know that the high frequencies have been deleted. So if the high frequencies have been deleted, the signal to noise ratio is very low, and the best thing we can do is to give it to zero. Uh, and then uh, we may compare the, the re result that we get after filtering with the original image. So the high frequencies that were deleted by the by the Gaussian filter, we cannot draw it ever. They were deleted from the image. So there is no way that we can take them back. Uh, yeah, and this is how it looks like. Now the edges look uh, a, a little bit more black, but we understand why. So this is just for comparison. Okay, so it seems that beam filtering requires um, requires uh, knowledge of the signal to noise ratio, but in reality, how do we get it? By the way, this binary filter is also called least mean square image restoration. So you know where this name come, comes from. Okay, so let's say that we have this picture and we want to apply a binary filter to it. Okay, so we need to estimate what is the, the spectrum of the noise. So we may go to a region where there is no signal and estimate the noise from there. So we go to that flat area and uh, we estimate the noise. So how do we estimate the noise? So for instance, we can uh, take the original signal, uh, blur it with a Gaussian, a relatively white Gaussian. So this is a sigma equal to five pixels. And we compute the difference. So the difference, so let's think of what we are doing. So if we think in Fourier space, so what we have is a signal. So let's let's make a drawing of that. So we have a signal. We are convolving with a Gaussian. And uh, this sigma, uh, this is sigma. And then uh, we are computing this one minus this. And this is our approximation. So this is our approximation. And this goes to class. Let's put it like this. It is I think more clear. Okay, so why is in Fourier space it is x minus x times the Gaussian? So this is x one minus the Gaussian. So the Gaussian is relatively white. So this filter, this filter, the shape of it, something like this. So it is a, a very narrow. So this is somehow related to the inverse of sigma. And this is frequency, and this is the holiday. Eight in Fourier space. So what we are doing is a high pass filter. Okay, so we are removing the very, very low frequency. And then, uh, except for the very, very low frequency, where we are not estimating the, the signal to noise ratio or the, the, the noise power, for the rest of the frequencies, we are computing what is the noise. So this filter here should be an estimate of the noise. This should be an estimate of the noise, except for this one. Okay, good. So, yeah, so now we can measure what is the variance of that and in each one of the channels. So we have the red, green, blue channels. We estimate what is the noise, and we assume that 
uh, we have flat noise. So now, what we are saying is that, okay, so that Gaussian, that sigma squared that we have is the is this energy. It's all this energy. Okay, so we are assuming that we have flat noise. What else? So now we need to estimate the, the kernel. Okay, so for the kernel, we will take a point where we can easily identify the convolution. So there is a very uh, bright spot here in the, in the glasses. So that was uh, because of the flash of the camera. There was a bright point. And this bright point is spread over a few <coughs> other pixels. So we can assume that the flash was just the delta. And then what we are seeing around is the, is the kernel. Because it is a, a delta component with the kernel is the kernel. So we can take these uh, nine pixels as the kernel. And now we have almost everything. Okay, so we have the kernel. Uh, they are expressing that's the signal to noise ratio, but you may remind that originally the expression of the filter was this one. So we will assume that the observed image is the an estimate of the ideal image. So we will make this approximation. So we will say that the signal to noise ratio is relatively high. So what we are saying is that, uh, let us go here. It goes a bit to your question, Mark and Ford. So what we are saying is that I is approximately X times X. Sorry. So this term is much higher than the term of the noise. That, that is what we are assuming. Okay, so then, um, yeah, so then we have everything. So we assume that the Fourier transform of our observation is the Fourier transform of the, of the original signal. We have an estimate of the noise. We have an estimate of the, of the filter. And then we can design our Wiener filter. And then we apply our Wiener filter to the image, and this was the the original, this is the filtered one. And you may not notice much of a difference. When you make a zoom, you, you see the, the, the differences. Okay, so this is the original with noise, and this is the filtered one following this process, and this is uh, the one using MATLAB. That MATLAB has a winner in two dimensions filter. And you see that it, it doesn't estimate uh, the high frequency so well. This is more black than this. But the important message here is that originally the formulation of the Wiener filter seems a little bit naive, right? Because it requires either no knowing the ideal image. So we have an, a, a degraded image, one with uh, PSF and noise. And to recover the ideal, we need the ideal. So you see this W, I is the ideal. So this is naive. If you have the ideal, you don't need the filter to, to recover that. But then you may approximate this one by your, by your observation. And the other thing is that if you reformulate in the way I did in the, in the whiteboard, then instead of the ideal, what you need is the signal to noise ratio. And this is something that you may characterize in your system. This is a spectral signal to noise ratio, which is a signal to noise ratio at each one of the frequencies. And then again, you don't need the ideal. And the results are pretty good. So this binar filtering is, is one of the most used classical techniques. 
Any question? Any question? No? Okay, so let's uh, continue. Then uh, that was for uncorrelated noise. So let's go today for correlated noise. Okay, so here we have an example of correlated noise. So uh, you have an ideal image, and this image has been corrupted by uh, noise, and this noise is not independent. So once you know it, you know the noise value at one of the pixels, you automatically know something about the noise in some other region. Okay? So that is the definition of correlation. It doesn't mean that you know the noise value, but you know something of where that noise value should be, where more or less. Okay, so yeah, th these kind of patterns appear, for instance, when you have analog, um, analog transmission and you have an interference of, of two signals, you very often have this kind of, of interferences. Okay, so uh, one possibility would be, okay, if I take this image and I compose with this kernel, I will get rid of the the noise because I am adding of, of these bars because I'm adding shifted versions of this image and then the this is a kind of sign and then the sign will, will disappear. The problem is that yeah the, the bars have disappeared but also all the details in that direction. Okay so this is not a good idea so let's see if we can find something better. Okay, so yeah, let's say that uh, this is the, the original image and this is the, the, um, the uh, so this is the power spectrum of the original image, this is the power spectrum of the observed one. And now, if we look at this, let's, let's make a zoom in this area. If you make that zoom, you recognize these two extra bright spots that were not in the arena. And do you understand why we have two bright spots in the power spectrum? What is the shape of this interference? Okay, we have to describe it. It's a wave, right? And what is the sign? This is the Fourier transform of the sign. It's a pair, of, a, a pair of deltas. So what we are seeing is the pair of deltas. So now uh, we we could design and make it in one knee because I, I can draw better in one knee. But if you know that your interference, let's. So this is full space, this is our noise. It's a function of, of frequency. And you know that, that your power spectrum is something like that. You may design a filter that is almost flat everywhere, then you multiply by zero. So is one everywhere. You multiply by zero and then you go back to one. So how what is the name of these filters? Band reject. Sorry? Band reject. Yeah, band reject or band reject filters. Or not filters. Not filters. Okay, so all I have to do, and, and in two dimensions, it would be the same. So in two dimensions, I would have the, I would have omega x, omega one. So it would be one everywhere. So it would be, let me draw this in this way. Except for this couple of points, where we multiply by zero, but otherwise, would be green everywhere. So it would be one 
everywhere except at these two points with this here. This is a notch uh, filter, but now in two dimensions. Okay, so yeah, that would be a way. That is what we have here. So we have a filter that is one everywhere, except that the two frequencies that we want to eliminate. And then when we multiply the, the noisy power spectrum by the filter, this is what we get. And we can look at the, uh, at the result. The result is almost clean everywhere, except that at the borders. So why at the, at the borders we have problems? Because? Because of the periodic conditions imposed by the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform is repeating this image infinitely many times. And then we are causing discontinuities. Think of this one repeated here. So we are coming from blue, and then suddenly we go into black, white, etc. So that is causing a, a very high uh, um, step, and th that step causes that uh, we cannot eliminate exactly, exactly the, the sign at that frequency, at that in, in the borders. Okay, so this is a, an algorithmic description of of the process, but it, it is simple, so I will not spend time on that. Okay, so now, how to determine the spot that you want to eliminate, or what is the frequency that you want to eliminate? So let's take an image of size r times c. So we have r rows c columns, and then we do the Fourier transform. And you know that the Fourier transform, this goes uh, in this, uh, just after the Fourier transform, we have uh, from 0 to 2 pi. If you want to, to put the zero frequency in the middle, you have to do this at a this one here. So that it, the frequency space goes from minus pi to pi. Um, and then what are the sizes? So the sizes are this one. So it is approximately this C half plus one. So yeah, you can be very detailed about if this is rounding down and then this is rounding up and minus one. It is about C divided by two. So you have about C divided by two coefficients to the left and C divided by two coefficients to the right with a small details about rounding up plus one minus one. And uh, yeah, so yeah, for instance, for this particular size, we would have these, um, the, these numbers. Okay, so now you take uh, once you have centered it, so once you center, let's say that this coefficient here it occupies a position that is R1 C1 in Fourier space. And, and then I want to know the frequency, so this, this U and V are frequency, this is the omega x, omega y that I normally use. So I want to know how to translate this RC index into a frequency. Okay, so yeah, we have the formulas for that. So if you have this is R1, uh, this is R1C1, this one is R2C2. So you may uh, compute them from uh, R2 or from, uh, so R2C2 are translated into U and V, or alternatively, R1C1 can be also translated into U and V. Okay, so, uh, this is this uh, emission symmetry, so that this coefficient has to be 
the complex conjugate of this one. And then if this has uh, omega x, omega y, this has minus omega x, minus omega y. And then once you have omega x, omega y, you can calculate all kinds of uh, wavelengths, frequencies. They, just a reminder, these are the, this is the wavelength in the direction of propagation of the wave. So in this direction, this process. And, and then what is the associated uh, frequency in the direction of the wave front? And what is the angle of the wave from? Uh, you can calculate everything. This is a uh, this is the same slide that uh, we had at the beginning when we were talking about the Fourier transform. And here is a another again the same kind of, of of representations that we have. So, for instance, let's say that uh, you have. Uh, lambda in the direction of the waveform, that is uh, 32 times the, the square root of 2, this is the angle, then you know that we have two induced uh, uh, wavelengths, one in x, another one in y. So this 32 times the square root of 2 is in this direction. And then in x we have a different wavelength, uh, and in y we have a different wavelength. And we can re uh, relate the wavelengths in X and Y, the frequencies in X and Y, and so on. Okay, so here is another example. So let's say that we have a pixel that is uh, bright at the location that uh, from the origin, so this is the origin, 0, 0. So from the origin, it occupies a position 8 in V, so in, in omega X and minus 8 in omega y. And then you can compute what are the frequencies, the wavelengths, you can compute everything. So this we already know. And yeah, so this is another example. OK, so uh, let's see. Uh, I think, yeah, we, we may start. Then. So, one situation in which we have this uh, complicated noise is when you print images. So, when you print images, we already saw how uh, they were printed. They were printed using four colors this CMYK, so cyan, magenta, yellow, and, and black. And we know that each one of these. Uh, Inks is using a different pattern. So, for instance, uh, uh, one of the patterns was this one, for instance. And this pattern uh, can be expressed as the addition of two waves. So, it is the addition of this wave plus this one. So, in Fourier space, this wave uh, is, is represented by these two deltas. This wave is represented by these two deltas, and the addition of the two is just the addition of the four deltas. And if we have a different uh, orientation of the of the grid, so this is one, uh, for instance, let's say this is the, the grid that the that CN is using. This is the, the grid of the black, let's say. So what we have is deltas are different uh, locations in frequency space. And here are all the grid, all the patterns that uh, the different colors are using. And then we know that the addition of all these patterns, they are creating these uh, rosettes. So uh, when you do the, the Fourier transform, so the CN is using these deltas, magenta is using these deltas, yellow, black, and then what we have is a collection of deltas in the power spectrum. Okay, so yeah, in real space, they would look like this. Um, you know how to print. So for printing, what we are doing is we are decomposing the original signal into its cyan, magenta, yellow component and black components, and multiplying 
high degree fashion. So these are the, the converted images in each one of the colors, and then we multiply by this, and this is what we get. And, and then our final result is just the addition of these four images. So let's see if now, so this is good for printing, but let's say that you have a printed image, you scan it, and now in the computer you have this process, but they, they are very unpleasant. So we don't want the rosette there. That is good for printing, but not for a computer. So what we will do later is just to get rid of this uh, this rosette. But we will do it after the break. Our scanned image with rosettes, and now we are going to try to get rid of it. OK, so let's uh, let's take an image. So for instance, this one, we have a scanning. Uh, this is uh, 600 DPI. So what is DPI, you know? Dots per inch. Okay. Inch is like a, a, a length a unit, like centimeter. So you have 600 dots per inch. So actually that is giving you the, the pixel size. So uh, the pixel size is one inch divided by 600. And if you make a zoom, you see the, the rosettes. So now we take this image, we compute the fully transform, and we see all these bright spots. But we understand where they're coming from. They're coming from, from the printing uh, pattern. And, and then uh, we already know how to, uh, how to calculate what is the wavelength and everything associated to any one of these spots. So what we can do, uh, that there is a mistake here. This is a uh, sigma. So uh, we may conform our image with a Gaussian uh, that has a, a, pix a, a width of sigma equal one in pixels. Uh, and then this is the, the blood image. This is the power spectrum. You know, this Gaussian with sigma equal one is pretty narrow. So in Fourier space, it is very wide. So there is a damping. Yeah, there is a damping, but it is not too, too visible. Then we increase sigma to two, and now we see the damping much better. Okay, so this is this is the shape of this of this Gaussian. So it goes, and then at, at this frequency, it has already gone to zero, or to almost zero. And then this is with sigma equal two, with sigma equal four, sigma equal eight. With sigma equal eight, we have get rid of, we have got rid of all the rosettes, but also the image is, is rather large. And the reason is that we have removed all the high frequency uh, components of the Fourier transform. So we may compute, for instance, the difference between the, the original and the filtering. So this is what we are filtering out. And we see mostly rosettes, uh, but we also see a bit of, a, of, of the underlying image. So with sigma equal two, we see more of the underlying image. With sigma equal four, we see that we have removed, we have filtered out a significant amount of the signal. So ideally, what we would like to see the difference is just the process, not the not part of our signal. Okay. So, uh, but we already know this technique. So what we can do is take the Fourier transform, find the location of these black spots, and then design a filter that is one everywhere except at those locations where we have where we put the zero. And rather than just filtering uh, one particular frequency, we may enlarge these points to filter out the region. So just to make the, the filter a little bit smoother. So what, what is the problem of having a very, very sharp uh, Filter like this one. So let's uh, 
let's think of these um, filters here. So, let's say, so let's say that I want to get rid of that frequency. So this will be my filter. Fully space. This is module. And then I will design a few filters and we will discuss about them. Not a few, but maybe much, much chapter. This is one, the other one is two. What is the problem of the green one with respect to the, to the blue one? Is much narrower, so in principle that is good, right? But there is a problem with very sharp. We saw it with instead of this one, think of this figure. This is the difference between this one and this one. Really. So in real space, in real space, this one, this one has a lot of reading, while the blue one doesn't have so much. It may have a bit, but it is much more. So now this is a, this is time. So this is time. This is frequency. Okay. So the problem with very sharp edges is that we have reading. So that is why, instead of designing a notch filter that is so, so narrow, we will make it bigger. And, and we already know ways to do that bigger. So this is an image. This is an image that has ones and zeros. So for instance, I can convolve that with a Gaussian. This convolution is in real space, in Fourier space. This is a mass, this is an image that lives in Fourier space. So I make a convolution, for instance, with a disk, or I can make a convolution with a Gaussian, or I can do both. So I do a convolution with a disk first, and then with a Gaussian. So you can be very creative there, how to make those, those notch filters not to be so, so sharp. Um, and once you have your mass in Fourier space, you simply multiply your Fourier transform of the, of the input image by the mass, by the filter you have designed. Um, and then if we multiply, we are getting rid of the, these low frequency components, but still there are some light spots. So we should see a bit of the rosettes, but not so much. At least the lowest frequency components of the set, they should be gone. Okay, so this is the original, this is the power spectrum of the original. This is after uh, multiplying by this filter, and then this filter, and then this filter, and then this. And we may, as we did before, we may compute what is the difference between our output and the original. And it should be the rosette. So this is after the first round of filtering. So this one here. This is after the second round. This is after the third round. And it, it behaves as it should. This is low frequency difference. This is high frequency, a little bit higher frequency difference. This has an even higher frequency. So it goes in the right direction and we don't see a significant amount of signal here. So we don't see the hand, we don't see the growth there. So we have not filtered out an important part of the, of the input image. Any question? Okay, so otherwise we move to a different kind of filters. 
And these filters, uh, they, they are very easy, but they, they're also very, uh, very much used. This, are, this is called the medium filter. Actually, it appeared in one of the, of the papers we, we saw in previous days. So this medium filter is a one that belongs to a family of techniques that they are called mathematical morphology. So we will see this, this lecture and the next two lectures are on mathematical morphology. OK, so uh, the, the medium filter is a filter that is playing in the whiteboard first. Okay, so let's say that we have an image. This is the input image. This will be a filter image. And for every pixel here, so for every pixel, we compute the neighborhood. And then this pixel. We will make some calculations in that neighborhood. And the calculation is what we uh, uh, put at the output. So in, in principle, this is the same as we are doing with the convolution. The convolution, we have this, the same kind of scheme. So I have a location. I go to the equivalent location in the equal image. I take the neighborhood and do some calculation with the neighborhood. The difference with the convolution make a convolution here. So the convolution, the operation that I'm doing with the neighborhood is a sum over the pixels in the neighborhood. So let's say that these Ri are the, are the pixels in the neighborhood. And then I'm multiplying by what is the distance between your location to the location of the neighborhood. So this is the operation we do in the convolution. So each one of these pixels here, they are weighted by a different value. And the, that, that is the value of the kernel. So now, with the medium filter, instead of doing that, we will take the, all these numbers, so the red ones, the ones from the original image, as a collection of numbers. So we have here a collection of numbers that are the ones coming from this region, we will solve them we will solve in ascending order. So we will take the middle one. So that is called the median. So you know that the median, uh, so when you have a, we have a statistical distribution. So let's say that you have a distribution something like, like this. This is x, this is the probability density function of x, and the median is a value, this is median, is a value such that this area here is 50% of the probability, and this area here is also 50%. It has Small details like the median is not uniquely defined. If there could be several values that are the median and so on, but yeah, let, let's forget about those small details. So the main the definition of the median is that the probability of a is being smaller than the median is zero. And that is a, a more theoretical uh, definition. In practice, that means that if I have a collection of numbers, then a, a way of computing the median is you sort those numbers and take the one in the middle. I was going to ask if there was another number, that's not going to happen. I was going to ask if it was an odd number, no, an odd number, even number that we have. Yeah, that, that is what I was saying. For instance, let's say that we have four numbers. So if we have four numbers, and let's say one, three, five, and seven. seven. 
so the median is not uniquely defined. So any number between uh, three and five, so three, any number in this, in this, we uh, absolutely go away. That's the reaction. Right? So any number, let's make it open. This region in this interval uh, is immediate. So it is not really defined. Yeah, but those are the small details. Typically here, what you do is you take the as a representative of the, of the interval. Okay, so yeah, so here you have the, the result. So this is our, our input image, and you take the median, and that is what you get. And then there are a number of qualifiers we can put on this filter. So we can say it is nonlinear, so the convolution is a linear operator. The median filter is a non-linear operator. And you know already what it means, linearity. So linearity means, let's put it in terms of a filter now. So we, we know the general the general definition. So the general definition is that the transformation T is linear if when apply I explain it for this. This is the general definition of a linear transformation. And if we put it in terms of, of filters, so that would mean that the median filter applied to a couple of millimeters is in general not the same as. A times the median filter applied to I1 plus B the median filter This is linear, this is linear, this is non-linear. In the particular case of the median filter. Okay, good. So it is non-linear. It belongs to a family of filters that are called morphological filters. We will see more about this. And it is similar somehow to a uniform blurring filter. So uniform blurring is just a, a flat kernel, which returns the mean value of the pixels in the neighborhood of the pixel. So somehow similar to that. But it tends to preserve the edges. So it is like computing the mean of the average. So it is just like computing the convolution. Oh, sorry. It's like computing the convolution with this kernel. So this kernel. So it is somehow similar to that, but we know that convolving with that kernel doesn't preserve the edges, so the edges become more black. While with the median, the edges are preserved. So, yeah, this is the, the same I have been explaining. So, yeah, you need to define. And this here we are starting to, to introduce the notation we will use for, for morphological filters. So, uh, you apply the median to an input image at the location P, and you need to define what is the neighborhood. So you need to define how, what is the shape of this neighborhood here. So this is set. And when you write P plus set, this is simply, this is P. So this is the vector. And then P plus set is the neighborhood is uh, shifted to the location of P. So it is the set of pixels, this set of pixels here. 
Okay, so what we are doing is just the median of all the pixels Q that belong to the support of this set. Okay, so now we can be creative again about our neighborhoods. So why taking a square neighborhood? Taking a neighborhood that has this shape. And then uh, I will take the median of all the values that belong to that neighborhood. And as I told you before, you take all the gray values, you sort them in ascending order, and then you take the middle. One. And that is the one that goes to the to the output image at the location P. Uh, and here it is why uh, it preserves uh, uh, the edges. So let's let's make it in 1D so that we can see better the edges. So let's say that we have a, a signal, and this signal is a step function, uh, and this step function. So it is a uh, this age. This age is uh, it, it is the heavy side that is the function. Heavy side was the name of the guy. I'm sure that you have heard of him. This heavy side. So this is this is step function. This is the one on the case. And you have multiple versions of it. So you have the one with continuous time. And you have also the one in discrete time. In discrete time is like this. So this one, this one, and this is and this is U of okay. Okay, but so we have this uh, instead of U, you have H, which is the same. Okay, so we have a step function in this bit time and it changes at 32. So up to 32 it is 0, on 33 it is, it is 1. And then we are shifting it up by this uh, 0.25. So it, it, is, it doesn't go from 0 to 1, but it goes from 0 to 5 to 1.25. And then on top of this ideal signal, we have some, some noise. And this noise will be uniformly distributed between minus 0 0.25 and plus 0. So what we observe is this blue curve, that is the, the heavy side step plus the uniform noise. Okay, so let's uh, let's make the the Gaussian filter of it. Oh, not the Gaussian. The mean, the mean filter of it. So for the mean, what we are doing is just uh, computing. There's some mistake here. So this this uh, sum should go from minus four to four. Okay, so we are taking nine values. We are considering a, a location and then four. Uh, samples on the left, four samples on the right, and we are computing the mean. Uh, and then this is our mean. So here, computing the mean of nine samples is fine. So the mean of nine samples, uh, they all, ideally, in the original signal, they all have the same mean. So we should have an estimate of that 0.25. Here it is the same. So if we are taking nine samples here, and uh, taking the mean is fine because we have uh, an estimate of this 1.25. The problem is, is at the transition. So at the transition, at some point, part of our window will have a low mean, while the other part will have a high mean. And we are averaging the two parts of the window. Depends on how, how deep you have gone into the step, but you have more values from the left or more values from the right. Okay, so that is why you have this small transition from low values to high values. 
What happens if you compute the, yeah, this, this is just an example of this computation of the mean. Okay, so what happens if we compute the median? If we compute the median, I think we have, yeah. So let's compare what happens when we are at the sample 32 and what happens when we are at the sample 35, uh, 33. So when we are at 32, we have five samples coming from the low values and four samples coming from the high values. So the mean, the median, will be one of the of the low values. And when we are at the sample 33, it is the opposite. We have more samples coming from the high values and fewer samples coming from the small values. And then our estimate will be closer to this 1.25. So the edge is much better preserved because of this non-linearity. It makes a jump between having more low values to having more high values. So this jump is what it gives this non-linearity. And we may compare the, the three results. So the black one is the is the ideal signal, blue is the observation that is noisy, and then we have the one with the mean that is the green, and the one with uh, the median that is red. And you see that the transition is sharper for the median than for the, the average. Um, yeah, in the flat areas it doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter if you compute the mean or if you compute the median. Probably the, the mean is, is has fewer noise. But... And here you have, for instance, an example of these median filters that are applied to binary images. So let's say that we have this original image, then we have a noisy version of it. So here we have only two values, 0 or 1. Or zero, right, or whatever values you like. And this is the median filter. So we have exactly we cover the original, or almost exactly. So if you have this, uh, this median filter is also very good for this salt and pepper uh, noise that uh, we mentioned yesterday, yesterday or a couple of days ago. And here you have for grayscale images, so now we have a uh, Gaussian noise. So, yeah, these are uh, two versions of the noise here. So this is with blurring. This is computing the mean, this is computing the median. So the median seems to be uh, sharper. And you may, so for instance, let's say that you apply the, the so you filter once, and then you apply again your filter, and then you apply again your filter. So what happens? So this is after one iteration of your filtering. This is uh, after two iterations, three iterations, four iterations, five, ten iterations. So after ten iterations, this image has been degraded quite a lot. And you may understand why. All being a lot of time. Let's, let's make it in 1D. So I have an ideal image, and I'm convolving it with this one. That the equivalent here would be this in one dimension. The equivalent would be convolving with that filter. But now I'm convolving this again with H again. So the two convolutions. So a step factor or, or uh, a pulse like this one will work with itself. Now that what you get is a, is a triangle. But now it is bigger. So this one goes from minus one to one. This goes from minus two to two. And then you can hold again. Uh, you can hold again. Uh, you can 
mode again. And here you have uh, something that goes from minus 3 to 3. And it is not that actually this is very interesting. This is flat, right? So flat means the polynomial of degree zero. So this is C zero. This is a line. This is a line. So a line means polynomials of degree one. So this one is of this shape. So combining this with the again with the with the pass, with the step function, what you get is a polynomial of degree two. I don't know how to draw it, but it's something like that. It goes from minus 3 to 3. And you have discovered now something that I call splines. So this convolution with this step function is, is at the basis of splines. And you can think of this in Fourier space. So let's, uh, let's make the equivalent in Fourier space. So in Fourier space, the module of uh, and this is omega. So it's something like that. It has some oscillations. And I multiply again. So if I multiply again, what I have is now this was the original, but I multiply by itself. So now it is going, and now I multiply again. If I multiply again, it goes very smoothly. So the more I multiply, the more I support, the farther I move in this direction. So I'm filtering, I'm doing the low pass filter more and more, and I'm losing the high frequencies. So that is why the more you filter with the with the mean, the the more blurry it becomes. So at the beginning it was not that blurry. It didn't have that, but we didn't filter much of the noise. And the more we filter, the more blurry it becomes. And with the median it doesn't happen. So the median is preserving the edges. But it is because of this non-linearity. Actually, you know, the nonlinear filters, they cannot be analyzed in Fourier space as easily as we do with the, Fourier, with the, with the linear filters, with the convolution. So we cannot make a, 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 an analogy of this reasoning in Fourier space. Okay, so, yeah, so E, I keep, uh, I take an image and I convolve it k times with the, with the kernel. I keep convolving and convolving and convolving and convolving and I do it infinite times. What will be the final result? Just the average. Because I'm in Fourier space. Fourier space, this eventually, as you go to infinity, will just be a delta. So it will be zero everywhere. Just that the first uh, component is different from zero. What happens if you uh, do the same with the medium filter? So you apply the medium filter infinite times. So at the end, you will go to something that is called the median root of the, of the image. And it, and it is an image. So this is just a constant. It has the same value everywhere. So it is an image, but it's just a constant image. But this one has something meaningful. So it is like, if you keep blabbing and blabbing and blabbing and blabbing at the end, what you will have is just the average of all these values. Yeah, so it, it will be a flat image. If you keep applying the median, the median, the median, at the end, you will have this image, the same way. So at some point it stabilizes. 
And that stabilized image is called the median root. It's the median root of the image. And yeah, so you see what happens if you go to infinity, and then what happens if you go to infinity applying the median. At some point, it stops uh, changing the image. Any questions so far? No. Okay, so what if we have color images? So the median is well defined for scalars. So we go back to here. So the definition of the median is well defined for a scalar. But if you have, if this is not, if x is not a scalar, it is a vector. It is a median. So you may try to to find an equivalent. There is an easy solution to that. But that that is a kind of the poor man, uh, the poor man um, median vector median, if you want. So let's say that you have a color image, so we have an image that is a vector, we know that this has a red component that depends on x and y, a green component that depends on x and y, and then a blue component that also depends on x and y. So an easy solution would be okay, apply the median to the three. So that is kind of each one of the channels is a scalar uh, is a scalar image. So now the median applied to a vector image would be just the median applied to each one of the channels. So this is the easy solution. But let's see if we can have something more creative. Okay, so what is the definition of the median? The median is something, it's like the mean. It has a different particular definition, but both the mean and the median, they are values that somehow they try to be in the middle of the distribution. Okay, so if I have a set of vectors, so now these vectors are, uh, each one of the vectors is a pixel in the original uh, color image. So if I have a set of vectors, can you find the vector that is somehow in the middle? So this is the formulation of that problem. So I want to find a vector. Okay, I think that formulation is not. So let, let me formulate it differently. So So we have these vectors here. So let's call those vectors B. Okay, and we have many Bs. These are the Bs coming from a neighborhood. And, and then you try to find a vector B that minimizes the distance between uh, the Bi and the B. Or on I in the neighborhood. This neighborhood or the peaks and peaks. So you take your pixel P, you take all the color vectors around, and you try to find a vector that is some, somewhere in the middle. There is a problem with this. That is, okay, so this vector V that you find may not be any one of the input vectors, any one of the photos can be a new photo that wasn't there in the input image. So now we will modify a bit our program and say, okay, so you are not free to find any vector v, but you have to find the vector v in the neighborhood such that so i and k belong to the neighborhood such that that vector you have found is in the middle. So 
So now the VK is forced to come from the input input. It is one of the vectors in the neighborhood. Actually, both, both formulations would make sense. Okay, so this is the one that has been uh, expressed here. So you take the K and J vectors from the neighborhood, and then you try to find the K that minimizes the distance for all uh, the other J's. And here you have uh, an example of the application of, of those things. So uh, this is the input image, this is the corrupted one, and, and then uh, C, so you apply this color median, so this operation here, this operation here, uh, we call it color median. So you apply the color median to this one, and you apply the color median, so C is the color median of B, and then you apply the color median again, so D is the color median of C. And, yeah, and this is a description of the process. So let's say that we have these values of the original image, and these are the noisy uh, observations. So this is original, this is noisy, and then this is the three times three uh, median filter of this one. This median filter is applied as a scalar, and this is the, the three times three median filter, and then you apply it again. This is this process, but now a little bit more detailed. And here you have another example. So uh, this is the original. This is the noisy observation. And then this is the three times three color median applied twice. And you see it is very, very effective in getting rid of noise. And it's very well adapted to flat areas. So this is good for drawings, may not be so good for natural scenes. So for drawings, where you have a lot of flat areas, this, this medium filter is very well adapted to that. Yeah, and we can compute the differences with the originals and so on. So for instance, this is, you apply the color medium filter twice, and then you compute the difference to the original. So you have not completely, this, this one is good. So this one is good, but it is not the perfect original. So the, that there is a difference between your recovery image and the perfect original. And then you can compute all kinds of differences. So for instance, uh, what is the difference if I apply the color medium filter twice on the noise image? with respect to the color medium filter applied twice to the original. You, you can complete all kind of differences. Um, yeah, there is a problem, another problem with with this poor man solution. So this poor man solution could be that the vector that you find is not any one of the input vectors. It is the same as we have here. So maybe the V that I find here is not anyone in the neighborhood. Here I'm forcing it to be one of the neighborhood. But in this medium filter applied to each one of the channels independently, uh, it may not be any of the input colors. Uh, yeah, uh, we have here um, yeah, so the same example. But now, this is the color medium filter applied twice. And this is the medium filter applied to each one of the bands independently. So it is not terribly different. But you see, for instance, when, when, when you compute, this is the, this is the original. And yeah, you see, you see differences. And with the other one, yeah, with the other one also probably, for instance, this is the original, this is the color medium. So those differences are smaller than this one. See the 
differences are smaller than when you compute with, uh, this one and this one. For instance, these spots here, they have disappeared. You see, they have almost disappeared. In the, in, in the other one, uh, they stay a bit, a bit better. Okay, and then you can compute again all kinds of differences. For instance, uh, here is this interesting to define this thing. Uh, how good is your filter? So how you, you need to find a matrix of how well I have done my, my job. So one possible matrix is the fraction of pixels that are identical to the, to the original. And with the color filter, with the color medium filter, 29% of the of the um, of the filter pixels are identical to the original. And I don't know what is there. Yeah. So this is color medium filter applied to noisy, color medium filter applied to original, and then fraction of filter of pixels that are similar to both. And this is the medium filter, not the color medium. So this is the medium filter. So only 14% 40, of the pixels are identical. So you may compare this one to this one. So here you have found twice more uh, pixels that are identical to the original by applying the color filter, the color medium filter rather than the poor man uh, medium filter. Any question? But defining metrics is, is important. So it is not only a visual impression, this looks better than this one, but you need to find a number that tells you that uh, you are doing better. No other questions? 